makers and market movers. This is The Pulse with Francine Lockwood. Mm. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London with the conversations that matter, and here's what's coming up on today's program. U.S. officials are trying to ensure any retaliation by Israel against the unprecedented missile and drone attack from Iran avoids further escalation and a full-blown regional war. Aluminium surges by a record on the London Metal Exchange as traders respond to new U.S. and U.K. sanctions on Russian supplies. And the German Chancellor arrives in China, calling for fair competition as he looks to avoid a trade war. So good morning, everyone. Happy Monday. First thing is first, let's take a look at the European markets map. Now, if you look at some of the futures that we're seeing in the U.S., but also uh, here, actually, equity futures in Europe, uh, they're definitely showing signs of stability. Oil prices declining a touch. Again, traders now wagering that tensions in the Middle East will probably not escalate after Iran's attack on Israel over the weekend. I'm looking at oil dropping, again, a touch on speculation that the conflict could remain uh, contained, but we still talk about inflation. We look at some of the forward guidance that we'll get from Fed speakers. This is what the picture is looking like for U.S. futures. Again, investors already rattled really by sticky inflation and the prospect for higher for longer interest rates. And the last thing they probably needed was this escalation in the Middle East that injected a little bit of volatility into the markets. Now, for now, attention will definitely turn into Wall Street's earnings season, kicking off with some big disappointing numbers from some of the big banks on Friday. Today, we get Goldman Sachs, Schwab, M&T Bank as well. So you can see for the moment, S&P futures gaining some five tenths and eight percent. And I was looking at Brent crude. Let's also talk about gold. 2,351 last week was when we saw a record high. Now, to our top story, world leaders urging restraint after Iran fired more than 300 drones and missiles at Israel on Saturday evening. Now, the attacks, which were intercepted, marked the first time that Iran has targeted Israel directly from its own soil. Well, the Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu says Israel will defend itself. I have set a clear principle. Whoever strikes us, we will strike him. We will defend ourselves against every threat, and we will do this calmly and with determination. From our point of view, this operation is over, and there's no intention to continue the operation. But if the Zionist regime takes any action against the Islamic Republic, whether on our soil or in places belonging to us in Syria or elsewhere, our next operation will be much larger. Now, for more on all of this, we're joined by Sylvia Westall, Bloomberg's Managing Editor for Economy and Government News in Russia, Africa, and the Middle East. First of all, there was some terrific reporting on the ground, Sylvia, throughout the weekend. I know with a blog with a, a lot of reporters saying up, Israel defenses held up against the Saturday night assault from Iran. How are we expecting Israel to respond to this now? Well, the main thing that Israel has been focusing on has been how successful it was in defending from this attack. Um, and that's important given that six months ago, um, Israel was attacked by Hamas and there were questions raised about whether Israel could defend itself. So the fact that it defended itself from this large barrage of missiles and drones and this direct attack is important for Israeli officials to emphasize for a domestic audience at home. In terms of reaction, uh, you know, we've heard what Iran said you know, it would respond to any uh, retaliation. Um, it could be that things uh, go back into this idea of a shadow war in which there are indirect attacks uh, by Iranian proxies and also Israel indirectly attacks Iran by aiming at proxy groups within the region. These attacks that also they came from Iranian soil, but they also came from other places around the region. So Israel could feasibly attack those places instead. Um, if you look at the rhetoric of uh, Israeli officials and what's been going on, there are, you know, voices for retaliation. There are voices saying, let's let's look, have a look at things and take stock. Because the actual attack didn't cause, you know, much material damage and there were no Israeli fatalities, the pressure is easing off on Israel to immediately retaliate uh, in an escalatory way. Yeah. So, uh, Sylvia, what does this mean for the calls about a ceasefire in Gaza? And if there is concern about an escalation into a regional war, if not even a, a world war, what kind of pressure can the U.S. exercise for this not to happen? 
Sure. I mean, yeah, there's the big question of what U.S. leverage is over Israel and uh, in terms of um, keeping things calmer in the region. If you look at uh, whether, you know, the U.S. has had much influence what Israel's been doing in Gaza, uh, you know, countries around the region would say that the U.S. has lost its leverage given the extent of the devastation in Gaza. The U.S. would argue that it has had an influence. So it's a big question about whether, you know, the U.S. can actually prevent things from spreading. Um, the next steps are on Gaza. In some ways, it took the focus away from Gaza for Israel. Israel can now perhaps go back and say that it, you know, everything, the events of the past, you know, few days have shown that it needs to refocus its efforts on the military operation there. So all eyes will be on uh, what the military's next steps are in Gaza and where things go from there. Sylvia, thank you so much. Uh, Sylvia Westall there, of course, who oversees all of our coverage in the Middle East. And we are just hearing from Iran that they believe any new sanctions on themselves will not be constructive. Now, to talk more about the market impact, to also talk about metals and commodities, let's bring in UBS Chief Strategist, Banu Baweja, and our Bloomberg Senior Executive Editor of Energy and Commodities, Will Kennedy. Will, we'll get to you in a second because partly it's, of course, geopolitics, partly is also these sanctions on, on Russia. But Banu, are, are you surprised that markets are already stabilizing? Look, if you wanted to, you could take away several elements of hope from what is a very unfortunate situation. The fact that Iran is saying that this is a limited um, and they have concluded this phase of the operation. The fact that, thankfully, there has been absolutely no loss of life and really not much loss of property. And the fact that the U.S., while it says that their security of Israel is ironclad, they're not participating in an offensive. So, it, you know, it is rational that the markets are not panicking. No. But let's, you know, let's make... We have to really agree that this is a, an unprecedented situation, right? This attack is an unprecedented situation. I think it completely changes the tails in the market, really. And it's coming on the back of a 20% rally in oil prices already this year. Pump prices in the U.S. have gone from 305 to about 355 already, to about 350 already. And so that, I think it is already going to begin to tell on consumer sentiment. And if oil prices stay higher for longer, relative to the counterfactual, I think that will have an impact on the economy, especially at a time when the markets are already fully pricing in a cyclical recovery. So I think it really does mean that volatility changes, skew changes. And while this could be near-term inflationary, I think this is medium-term pretty disinflationary. See, I, I was going to ask you, actually, there, there's almost an assumption that it's automatically inflationary because it means that there's more, I, I guess, onshoring or end of multilateralism. So talk me through why you think it's the beginning of deflationary. Well, because if oil prices are higher relative to the kind of... Remember what happened in 2022 when everybody was worried about the Russian war was that in the latter half of the year, energy prices came off significantly. And that was one of the main reasons why we saw Goldilocks in 23 and early parts of 24. So if you're beginning to see a little bit of an oil the early parts of an oil shock. I mean, it's, it's still early to call it that. The curve is backwardated now only about $7. So if energy supplies are quite tight in any case and uncertainty is increasing, that brings increasing risks for the global economy at a time when the markets are nowhere close to price for it, at a time when the markets are priced for perfection, they are priced for Goldilocks. This does add caution into the markets and really says that at 450, the 10-year U.S. Treasury is quite attractive relative to some of the equity markets which are trading at 20 to 21 times forward earnings. So I think from that perspective, this makes that more compelling, the bond versus the equity story. Yeah, and I want to go back to actually Treasuries in a second. But, Will, what's your take when you look at, again, I think we heard from the IEA last week that actually demand is going to slow down in general for oil. But then you have these flare-ups really in a region that's very oil-rich. I think the oil market is best characterized like this. As uh, Bernie said, that we have had a significant run up this year, and that's because we have surprisingly strong to many supply demand uh, fundamentals. So far, demand has been stronger than people expected at the beginning of the year, and OPEC is keeping a very tight lid on supply. And on top of that, you've clearly got a layer of geopolitical risk. So the, there are good reasons for the rally. I agree that uh, traders this morning see that worst-case scenarios were avoided, so they're not taking a new position. And the other thing is OPEC retains a lot of spare capacity, which in worst-case scenarios, in major disruptions, gives them a policy manoeuvre to respond and put new market and new oil into the market, and that's why we haven't seen a stronger reaction this morning. Is that all Saudi spare capacity? Mostly Saudi, about 3 million day, barrels a day from Saudi Arabia, but also significantly from the UAE as well. A lot of the commodities have really shot up. But how much is this because of these new sanctions? from the UK and the US? Yes, yeah, so what we have seen in metals is the price of metals go up considerably this morning on the London and Metals Exchange because the new sanctions mean that London Metals Exchange, which is the, sets the global benchmark prices for many of the industrial metals we use, is unable to accept new Russian metal into its system. Now, that metal isn't going to go away. What's likely is it will go to China 
and China will pay a significant discount. So you're likely to emerge a bifurcated metals market where prices in London are a little bit higher, but China, which is after all the biggest consumer of industrial metals, will benefit from paying less for Russian metals. Um, but going back to Treasuries, I mean, I'm so, not, not surprised, but actually it's refreshing to hear that you still like Treasuries given there was an auction that didn't go so well. I mean, it was fine, but it didn't go great. And also the, the huge repricing that we're seeing in monetary policy, especially from the Fed. Yes, uh, and the market has repriced quite a lot. And to be fair, the data has been strong. I mean, we saw the yeah. CPI data as well. We do think that the disinflation, and we are with the Fed in that, we do think that the disinflationary pressure will continue and that over time we, we're going to move away from 0 0.3, 0 0.4 prints mm -hmm. on core inflation and move back towards 0 0.2 prints. And when I say in time, I don't mean in five years. I mean in the next two months we should be getting there. Now, given that, what the market's pricing for the Fed, which is about two, two and a half cuts this year, less than what the Fed, which is quite optimistic on the economy, themselves imply, the Fed that expects the unemployment rate to go to 4.1, themselves say we'll be cutting about three times this year. The market's leaving no room for risk premium. So at 491, although this has been said before, I'll admit that, but at 491, yeah. there is, I think, good value in the two-year. And at this minute, although I think the, the medium-term direction should be for the curve to steepen, i.e. twos do better than the tens, but in a situation like this, when there's heightened geopolitical risk, the market will first go for tens. More so in Europe, by the way, because Europe's at the beginning of a cyclical recovery and that might be getting nipped in the bud if energy prices, or mind you, not gas prices haven't done that much, but uh, energy prices in general have come up and that could actually compromise the cyclical recovery just when people are moving away from the US into yeah. Europe betting on that cyclical recovery. But, but, and we wanted to speak to you actually with Will because when you look at some of these commodity prices and especially the metals really on a tear, I mean, even gold was like at a record high. Do, what does that give to your you know, like strategic overview? Are there alarm bells or are there like pockets where, where you see danger zones? Uh, I think gold is a special situation. I mean it has been a phenomenal performer and I think it's going to perform more. The fact that gold is here despite despite real interest rates going higher, is really a big statement, right? Because usually when real interest rates rise, gold prices come down. Real interest rates are the bigger, biggest driver of gold. Now you have uh, the potential of real interest rates coming down over the next two to three years, and you have geopolitical uncertainty. I think even at 2400, gold does therefore offer value. I mean, it has gone through our, our India targets, but we are still long gold and we, we, we do really like it. The other metals is a, is a different case, right? So China has been putting a lot of credit into the system, not the property part of the system, but the industrial part of the system. Uh, at this minute, we would not be chasing some of the bulk metals, mm -hmm. certainly, right? Maybe a little bit of upside in the near term for copper, but not so much for, not so much for iron ore and so on. So, we, so those metals, we, we would actually be going the other way. So much a clear view of precious yep. over base, over bulk. Okay, Banner, thank you so much. Will, thank you so much as well. That was our senior executive editor of Energy and Commodities, Will Kennedy, UBS chief strategist, Banu Baweja stays with us. In the meantime, we're getting some breaking news out of Singapore. There's change in the leadership. The Prime Minister, Lee Sien Lung, will relinquish his office on May 15th. So he'll basically step down as Prime Minister. Uh, he will formally advise the President to appoint a Deputy Prime Minister and a Minister for Finance, Lawrence Wong, to succeed him. So this was pretty much expected. I'm not sure we knew exactly the timeline, but we did have a story back in December uh, saying that effectively Lawrence Wong was a prime minister in waiting. We'll see what that means for policies going forward, especially in these turbulent geopolitical times. Now coming up, the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz arrives in China, but can he deliver his delicate message about ending discriminatory business practices? That's next, and this is Bloomberg. So German Chancellor Olaf Scholz has called on Chinese officials to promote free trade and equal business opportunities. He's in China to deliver a delicate message that if Beijing does not heed European warnings to end discriminatory business practices, Brussels will have no choice but to escalate trade defense mechanisms. Now let's get back to UBS chief strategist Banu Boweja. Banu, well, thank you so much for sticking around. First of all, so we'll talk about this relationship, which is frankly uneasy, with you know between the EU, EU, EU and and China, um, less so than the U.S. and China and the place in the EU. But what kind of economy are you seeing for China going forward? So we do think that the property market stays under pressure right now, not under the kind of pressure that we saw last year where no. property sales were declining by 30 to 40 percent annualized. I think that's likely to begin to stabilize. No. Uh, but what China has been doing while the property market has been under pressure is that it has been allocating a lot of credit to infrastructure, to the industrial sector. And as a result of that, if you look at China's export 
volumes, they've been going through the roof at a time when global trade really isn't doing that much. Really, because China's gaining market share at the expense of many of its competitors, China's gaining market share. And hence, Schultz's comments about overcapacity. So when you know, China's taking away from Peter, which is the property market, to give to Paul, which is, which is infrastructure. And that actually means that it can compromise the global industrial complex. Right? So it really is, I think dumping would be too strong a word, but China's gaining market share very, very quickly. And that, again, sends a disinflationary impulse. Right now, when you look at the way European cap goods trade, you wouldn't know it. Right now, if you look at the way the U.S. curve trades or the European curve trades, you would know it. But in some of the emerging markets, this is beginning to become apparent. Like in Korea, you're beginning to see pressure on, on, on Mexico. You're beginning to see pressure on, on Brazil. So these emerging markets are beginning to feel pressure from Chinese exports yeah. gaining share. And I think that will continue. I so said China will continue to allocate. The delta over the next six months, Francine, is probably going to be that the Chinese consumer that has been very weak so far begins to stabilize, begins to stabilize. And that will tell in the Chinese equities mar equity market. So we are long Chinese equities as a tactical trade, have been for some time, and will remain, I think, for the next three to six months. Banner, is there any way that Europe and, and the U.S. can also counter some of the deflationary pressures coming from China, apart from tariffs? Well, at this minute, remember, Europe and, and U.S. are worried about inflationary pressures of their own domestic economy. Yes. But other than tariffs, I don't think Europe sure. is going to play a currency game, right? I mean, it, it, it's not a managed currency anyway. The U.S. Yeah. is not a managed currency anyway. So I'm afraid that if, it, if push comes to shove, if yeah. they continue to feel that China is uh, gaining market share and unfairly so with export prices coming down, then I think we are headed towards more protectionist policies. I mean, the, the Fed, I mean, we went through the year thinking that there's almost like, you know, global consensus on what central banks will do in terms of, in terms of cuts. I mean, the, the Fed seems in a very precarious situation given the last inflation numbers. Are we overthinking it? No, look, it, it, you have to think this through because the labor market is very tight. Um, uh, inflation is still quite high. But we have to remember that if you, if you look at where real interest rates are, the Fed themselves, as, as a, you know, their median dot says three lower, maybe the median dot will change a little bit, but look at where real interest rates are. Real interest rates are at 2%. You know, this is at a restrictive level. And in fact, the market expects them to be at 2% for the next year, the year after that, and pretty much till infinity. The market's, look, the market's basically saying the R star has not shifted by 25 basis points yeah. or 50 basis points. It's shifted by 150, 175 basis points. That's a high bar. That's a very high bar. So it, it's difficult for me. To, the, the Fed will sound very cautious. The market's already taken it down to close to two, two and a half cuts. Maybe it can go a little bit more, but... It's not just what happens in the next six months. It's also what happens one year, one year, so deck 25. And that's where the Fed may have to overcompensate in the opposite direction, which is why at close to 5% on the two-year, I think that's reasonable value. Banu, thank you so much. Banu Baweja, UBS chief strategist, stays with us. We'll talk a little bit more maybe about the UK next. This is Bloomberg. Still with us, UBS Chief Strategist Banu Bawaja. Banu, we were having a good spirited conversation about inflation forces and what the Fed does next. I mean, the U.S. economy seems to be, I mean, apart from last year where we thought there was no landing or recession and then actually it kind of like flatlined through the year, it is again a bit of a mystery. Like, why are, why are markets getting it so wrong? The U.S. economy has done very strong for, for, for a very long period of time. For the longest time, people thought this was about excess savings. Yeah. Uh, this was about the fiscal impulse. But, but more recently, what's also becoming quite apparent is that there is a positive labor supply shock, right? Yeah. The, the immigration numbers that are coming through, these numbers are very strong numbers, 3.3 million a year by, by some estimates. Uh, and even though the Biden administration, so not a Republican administration, the Biden administration mm -hmm. has also tried to take these down. It has failed to do that. So that positive labor supply shock really has meant that demand for, for particularly goods, right? So, yeah. so services you would have thought would have, would have done very well after COVID. People revenge spend on theater or on, or on holidays. You haven't seen that much, but you actually seen goods demand become very, very strong, which is what happens when lower income people yeah. consume sort of the, the low income immigrants coming in. So, so a lot of the puzzles in the U.S. economy, low jobless claims, very strong payroll numbers, very strong consumer goods numbers, all of these do seem to be answered by what I think I would describe as a positive 
labor supply shock. Right. So that seems to be happening. And, and you're, so I thought productivity in the U.S. was also really strong, and you really put, kind of push back against that. Well, look, the productivity data itself doesn't suggest that it's, it's very strong, and I would completely admit, and Greenspan taught us this in the 1990s, that productivity data is, is, is ridiculous in how volatile it is, and, and it does get revised a lot. But when I look at CapEx, including CapEx in yeah. tech, right, by the way, much smarter people than I think that AI is as big as the steam engine, if not bigger, right, in, in terms of the productivity shift. But from my little vantage point, when I look at what's happening with CapEx for tech companies, for, in, yeah. uh, for information yeah. technology equipment, for software, for research and development, the pace at which this CapEx is growing is much lower than the 1990s. Yeah. So I don't really see these companies themselves being as enthused as the narrative seems to be about a major shift in, in productivity. So. Uh, you know, we'll find out how things go, but what I think right now is happening with the U.S. economy is not a productivity miracle, but more just a simple old-school labor supply shift. And that's why what I'm going to be watching very closely is what happens to immigration under this regime, potentially under the next regime. We haven't even talked about the U.S. election. You have to come back, Ben. That was really Absolutely. fun. Ben Boweja, UBS chief strategist. Coming up, we'll also be speaking to Robin Niblett. He's former director of Chatham House. We'll get his view on the latest out of the Middle East. That interview is next, and this is Bloomberg. Well, U.S. officials are trying to ensure any retaliation by Israel against the unprecedented missile and drone attack from Iran avoids further escalation and a full-blown regional war. Aluminium surges by a record on the London Metal Exchange as traders respond to new U.S. and U.K. sanctions on Russian supplies and the German Chancellor arrives in China calling for fair competition and he looks to avoid a trade war. Well, good morning everyone and welcome to The Pulse. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, the U.S. is hoping to avoid further escalation, leading to a wider war in the Middle East following Iran's attack on Israel on Saturday. Now, U.S. National Security Spokesman John Kirby told NBC that while the U.S. is not seeking a war with Iran, it will continue to support Israel's defense. Whether and how the Israelis will respond, uh, that's going to be up to them. We understand that and respect that. But the president's been very clear. We don't seek a war with Iran. We're not looking for escalation here. We will continue to help Israel defend itself. Well, John Kirby, communications advisor for the White House National Security Council, will join surveillance later today to discuss the latest on the Middle East. Now, for more analysis, we're also joined by Robin Niblett. He is former director of Chatham House. He's also the author of The New Cold War, How the Contest Between the U.S. and China Will Shape Our Century. Robin, as always, thank you so much for joining us. It was quite a, um, an eventful weekend, and I think a lot of people were really concerned this was the start of something bigger. Can you now discount retaliation from Israel? Uh, no, you cannot discount retaliation from Israel. I think there will have to be some type of retaliation at some point. But I think the big difference is in, in what you heard John Kirby there say, say we're, we're ready to defend uh, Israel, but defending in Israel and supporting Israel on attack is, of course, a completely different thing. So the uh, uh, Israeli government right now is going to have to think very carefully about the options. You've got pressures inside the cabinet itself. Uh, those like Benny Gantz, the leader of the opposition that's in the uh, war cabinet, saying we need to build a regional coalition, we need to take our time, think and, and pick carefully. You've got Bezalel Smotrich, Ben Gavir on those sides, the national uh, security ministers saying if we don't attack now, if we don't demonstrate uh, that we can be tough, uh, then at any moment we'd get an even bigger attack. So inside Israel itself, he's under huge pressure. What can the U.S. do to actually try and, and keep this under control? Well, uh, as I said, nothing to the extent that they cannot, I think, stop Israel from conducting some type of attack. But, of course, what they can do is try to make sure that it is uh, calibrated to a certain level that hopefully the Iranians would then see it as an escalation themselves and you'd have a, a, des a de-escalation rather than an escalation taking place. I think the other part is uh, what else comes into the mix. Um, do uh, the uh, Israelis, for example, say, well, if we're not going to attack uh, Iran in a really massive way, we need scope to be able to finish off the job and take out Hamas uh, in the south, in, in Rafah in Gaza. Um, so, in other words, what might Israel demand from the United States in return for being careful in its response would be something I'm sure the Americans will be thinking about very carefully. But is this convenient, Robin, for Benjamin Netanyahu because it also puts the spotlight away from, you know, allies asking for a ceasefire in Gaza and the humanitarian crisis in Gaza? 
Um, it's helpful for, for Netanyahu in the sense that he now is the leader of Israel who did not fail on a security attack. He's now got, I suppose, some of his credibility back. You might say that Israel itself, perhaps psychologically, uh, feels more secure having seen itself be able to defend itself the way they did against this massive attack uh, over the weekend. But you've still got the danger to the north. What if Hezbollah had participated much more actively? They got 150,000 rockets. They could have really helped confuse uh, an Israeli response and a defense. So if you're sitting there right now in Israel, you must feel less secure than before. Uh, you've had, for the first time ever since 1991, uh, a direct attack on your territory. He's going to have to respond somehow. But it, what's Iran's end game here? So they say it's in retaliation for what happened actually in Damascus, Syria. What are they trying to achieve? I think. Uh, just like Israel is trying to demonstrate its deterrence, they are trying to show deterrence as well, saying to Israel, you don't get to take out two of our generals, seven of our people, uh, blow up our sovereign territory, as it was seen at the consulate uh, in, uh, in the attack that took place back on April the 1st. Um, so they are trying to send a signal to Israel saying, you don't have the escalatory scope. We can try to cap it. Uh, but obviously what they're not looking for is a wider war themselves with Israel. So where's China in all of this? Again, it's such a superpower, and they're fighting their own war with the U.S. Can China play a role in de-escalating or certainly stopping, you know, stopping things from getting out of hand? I just don't see how China has influence over Israel at this moment. Obviously, no. China can say to Iran, uh, over which they do have some influence, the main purchaser of their oil, you need to, to think about de-escalating. Please do not respond uh, beyond this in any particular way. But I think China looks weak and out of it in particular in this conflict. Uh, just one sidebar, it's ironic that they've invited Iran to join the BRICS. Um, an interesting choice now historically uh, if we look back at the kind of conflict that we're seeing in the region. Have you seen, I mean, you've been, you know, at Chatham House for many, I think over a decade. Yeah. Have you ever seen, you know, world politics so uncertain? Seeing this many conflicts uh, in a way uh, interconnecting simultaneously, Ukraine, obviously the risk of escalation now, uh, in the region. Uh, we still have in the South China Sea a potential escalation of conflict between uh, the United States and, and China. Um, the United States has made itself very clear that they're going to defend Philippines and their sovereignty uh, in the South China Sea. So, I mean, from a Chinese standpoint, I suppose the good thing that they can see is America is involved in all of those conflicts, right. whereas China is able to stand back and, and not be involved in them. So they are potentially, uh, you know, looking at this with a certain amount of insecurity and worry. They do not want conflict. They're trying to get their economy going again. Uh, but at the same time, I just don't think they have uh, any clout. But is the U.S. right in being so involved? Can they actually be involved and, and do a good job in all of these zones? Um, the U.S. has no choice but to be involved because the strength of the U.S. is uh, uh, the, the basis of its alliances. America is strong because it has allies and has alliances around the world. The problem is if all of those alliances are facing conflict simultaneously, then the United States obviously is exposed and, and, and the presidency is, is stretched as they are today. Uh, Robin, if there was an escalation, I mean, is it soon? Is the next you know, week, two weeks dangerous? Or c could it happen actually much further down the line? Um, look, people weren't able, right? people weren't able to predict the, yeah. the scale of the attack that we saw this last weekend. I would say um, it ca Israel's response cannot wait too long. Uh, so I think, yeah, we could be looking at risks certainly within the two weeks to the one month time frame. Okay, Robin, thank you so much, as always, for joining us. Of course, with uh, terrific thoughts and, and a briefing on what could happen next, Robin Niblet, former director of Chatham House. Now, coming up, we'll be joined by the chief executive of Novo Banco to discuss how the Portuguese bank is preparing for a possible IPO. More on that next, and this is Bloomberg. Now the conversations that matter, the insights you need. This is The Pulse and I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Portugal's Novo Banco has said it's preparing for an IPO in case its majority shareholder Lone Star wants the bank to go public. Well, I'm joined by Mark Burke. He's the chief executive of Novo Banco. Mark, as always, thank you so much for taking the time to come to Bloomberg. I'll ask you about the IPO in a second. But when you look at interest rates and actually, I guess, the divergence we're seeing between the ECB and the Fed, what does that mean for European banks? I think it's... it's uh, almost extraordinary that it looks like the European banks will be the first to experience a reduction in interest rates, which normally we are a lagger, but um, it seems to us that what will happen is a graduated uh, decrease in interest rates. We will still, in all likelihood, remain 
within a normal band. So okay. interest rates normalized two years ago, they will probably decrease by six, seven um, individual uh, reductions, yeah. but we will still be we will still be working in a normalised yeah. rate. I mean, so far, so you know, your bank, Novo Banco, but also other banks have benefited quite um, not dramatically, but I certainly profits have gone up because mm. interest rates have gone up. So, is it going to be tougher? In, in, if, the, if the ECB actually starts cutting in June, is it going to be tougher to hold on to those higher profits? Well, I think we're an example just like everybody else. So over a period of two years, our, our profitability increased from the kind of two, three hundred range up to about six, six seven hundred range, seven hundred and fifty for last year. What we have focused on, though, is making sure that this is sustainable. And, and we do that through kind of three or four different elements. One was to reduce the sensitivity mm -hmm. of our balance sheet, and our balance sheet is now significantly reduced. We've taken about 75% of the volatility out. So for every 100 basis points, we would lose about 6% of our net interest income. At the same time, we focus on our fee and commission streams, specifically mm -hmm. around wealth mm -hmm. management and around payments. And lastly, it's driving efficiency through the cost base. So with all of those, we, like others, would expect to maintain a, a sustainable level of profitability through time. So what's your take on, on the IPO? Are you getting ready? Yes. <laughs> how, I mean, so how do you get ready for an IPO? Well, the last, time, the last time we were here, I think we were about one, maybe one step in. So the first thing is you've got to build a track record. The idea is that to the market you demonstrate, you set, meet and beat targets over a period of time. So we're three years in. We now have a sustainable, profitable business. We're very clear about the markets we're in, the service that we want to maintain, and we can show a path of profitability. That's the first part. So I would say from our results this year, we're operationally ready as a business. And then the next part is to make sure that the balance sheet is ready. So we have a couple of things we need to do. We need to do some issuance of MREL. That will allow us to release uh, excess capital. Yeah. And then essentially we have a balance sheet ready to go. After that, yeah. it's a question of markets. When are the markets ready? And selecting the team and going into the marketplace. So, what would attract actually an international investor to Novo Banco? Um, an international investor to Novo Banco. The, the beauty of us is we are a simple, pure play Portuguese bank. So, Portugal as an economy is very attractive. I mean, over the last three years, you'll see that while the EU average in terms of GDP might have been six and then two, and each time. Portugal is outperforming by a multiple, often two to three times. So stable economy, stable economic backdrop, expectation of that to play out. And we are a very simple SME and retail bank in that, con in that context. So that is why somebody who wants to play Portugal and have a bank as a as a simple way of doing that would, would take would take the chance. Mark, have you already appointed actually banks to help you prepare for an IPO, or is it a little no, bit too soon? We have, no, we have not made any specific appointment. Obviously, we have many many new friends in the investment banking area, <laughs> um, and we are obviously designing the balance sheet and getting ready. But we haven't made the appointment. Of, of our lead banks yet. I, I know I think that last time you were on with us, you mentioned the dividend block and the fact that that would have to be removed yes. uh, before an IPO, but, mm. but that's not going to be removed before 2025. At the very latest, um, 2025, it would fall away. Yeah. But there is um, there's definitely the possibility that we can organize with our shareholders to remove that earlier, and that would then allow, as I say, the issuance of MRL, the final touches to the balance sheet, and then we're ready to go. So, at worst, N25, but any time between now and then, I think yeah. we can we can probably uh, reach a uh, an agreement yeah. uh, to remove that. Um, Mark, can you talk to me a little bit about the possibility of more consolidation between you know banks in Portugal, but also maybe cross border between Portugal and Spain? In in the you know over over 10, 15 years. You constantly hear, and it doesn't matter whether you're in UK, Ireland, Spain, Portugal markets, that this is a market that needs consolidation or that it's expected. And it very rarely happens, or it certainly doesn't happen in the timescale that people expect. 
So for us, we think Portugal is, you know, it's, it's in between the two extremes. So the extremes of an oligopolistic, Scandi, Ireland type market are a frag massively fragmented German market. You know, five banks have 70% of, of the banking assets. What's important is that we compete, endure, and succeed in this current configuration. Consolidation takes place, it takes mm -hmm. place. But I wouldn't be expecting anything in the near future. Yeah. But you wouldn't look, I mean, you, would you look at a, a possible merger instead of an IPO? Or is, is you know, definitely the IPO the next thing? Uh, the, the IPO is the base case. Um, if something happens or something comes up, then you deal with that as it comes up. But the only way you can really plan the bank is to say, we need to prepare, we get a prospectus written, we start to educate um, the potential shareholders, the, mm -hmm. the, the um, ultimate shareholders, and then if something happens during that process, it yeah. happens. Uh, Mark, what are you most optimistic about, actually, at your bank, when you look at some of the you know, loans? Like, is there a segment that's doing especially well? I think for us, um, we are becoming very focused on being a very good retail bank. So the, the combination of building a, uh, an ex a customer experience which is better than uh, anybody else in the marketplace, doing so efficiently is, is one side of the equation. Mm -hmm. The other is what we have always been. We're an SME bank. So the depth... Yeah of the relationships, the ability to understand each sector, the ability to actually assist them in their plans has been, that is our heartland, that is our DNA. So being able to do that, being strong enough to do that and to be able to lend and assist them in growing. So as an SME bank, I think we get back to being what we always were very good at. Mark Burke, thank you so much for joining us thank today. You. That was the chief executive of Portugal's Novo Banco. Now, we're also getting a bit of breaking news out of the Bloomberg terminal. The EU set to launch a China probe on medical devices procurement. So that could, of course, lead to either um, tariffs or actually it could lead to even the banning like we've seen in other cases. So for more context onto this is news just breaking on the Bloomberg terminal, let's go straight to Berlin and Bloomberg's Oliver Crook. So, Ali... Good morning. What do we know about the announcement? And it's interesting that it's also coming at a time where the German Chancellor, Olaf Scholz, is in China. Yeah, it's maybe not great uh, timing for Olaf Scholz. And basically, this is according to Bloomberg sources. And we may get the announcement from the EU um, in the coming days and weeks. And what it is is basically unfair procurement practices, particularly within medical devices in that industry, um, favoring domestic suppliers. And of course, what it follows is that probe into the EVs that we've already got. We had Janet Yellen coming um, to China and talking about sort of overcapacity being breathed too much excessively into the market by China. And all of this coming as Olaf Scholz is there, trying to walk that really fine tightrope line between trying to preserve the economic, uh, economic interests of Germany, which are, as we know, very, very vast with China. It has a much larger trading relationship with China than merely any other country in Europe. When you look at the numbers in terms of, it's about a quarter trillion euros of trade that they do every year. You know, France, which is also a huge economy, it's less than $100 billion. So it's an absolutely huge relationship. But it comes as they have been trying to step back a little bit. I mean, it's still down 15% from what it was the year before. And it's that sort of relationship right now, that awkward position where Olaf Scholz finds himself vis-a-vis -vis China, this sort of frenemies case where you want politically to pull some distance away, but your industry and your companies and your economy are so fundamentally dependent. So we've heard a lot about, you know, Germany de-risking from China. Is it really? Yeah, well, this is a, the interesting question, right? Let's just uh, illustrate some of the CEOs that are there with him right now, the BMW, Mercedes, BASF, Siemens, they're all with Olaf Scholz in China right now. I mean, a third of all of BMW's cars are sold there. Mercedes is similar. BASF, only about 13% of sales, but BASF have said... 50% of the chemical market of the world is in China. There's no way that they're stepping in. They're putting more money forward. And Siemens, it's a similar story. But when you talk to the companies, and actually this speaks precisely to the probe that's being launched here, about two-thirds of German companies that were surveyed by the German Chambers of Commerce in China complain about the fact that there is unfair competition in the market, whether it's access to government officials, access to subsidies, to taxes, tax breaks, all that sort of thing. Two-thirds of German companies are complaining about this. When you look at the supply chain, and this is the de-risking we've talked about, so German companies that are producing within Germany, how much of their supply, uh, uh, supply chain is dependent on China, it's still more than a third. That's down 10% from before the war in Ukraine, but that's still substantial. And Francine, what is actually very critical here and very interesting is 
is foreign direct investment in China. That has fallen off the cliff for most countries. Last year, Germany, German companies invested a record amount in developing their operations within China to the tune of about 12 billion euros. So on the one hand, you have a bit of de-risking, you have some a bit of unease, but on the other, a lot of these German companies are saying, listen, we have no choice. There's no other game in town. We're going to continue to invest in China. Ollie, thanks so much, Oliver Crook, there in Berlin. Now, coming up, another big week for U.S. bank earnings with Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, and Morgan Stanley set to report. We take a look ahead to all of that next, and this is Bloomberg. Now, it's another big week for U.S. bank earnings. Goldman Sachs, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, all due to report. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Jenny Serain. Jenny, I mean, you were kind of spot on on Friday. And actually, when we saw some of the big ones, they, they just weren't great. We had J.P. Morgan, City, Wells Fargo. What were your key takeaways? I, I mean, I think it's definitely the end of the boom time. So you had all of these banks talking about, you know, net interest income for this year coming down with the Fed poised to cut rates. Um, obviously, there's a lot of debate about how quickly that will happen or when exactly they'll start. But the, the main takeaway for these banks is, you know, net interest income is not going to be in the boom times that it's been in. Um, and we're going to have to start pivoting and really looking at um, other forms of strength in our, our books. And so you had them really pointing to capital markets. Um, you had them all talking about this uh, long awaited rebound and deal making. Um, you really saw them really trying to kind of focus on the parts of their business that might actually look really good as rates start to come down. So what's the key metric that investors will watch out for today for, for Goldman? I think, I mean, Goldman is a Wall Street bank, so you've really got to look at things like trading, investment banking. Um, and to be fair, you know, trading did come in a lot better than expected on Friday um, at both J.P. Morgan and Citigroup. Um, and they both, you know, talked about a rebound in capital markets. Um, and so I think those will all be positive signs for Goldman. Uh, what you did hear a lot from Jamie Dimon, Jane Frazier, some of these other big CEOs on Friday was um, they think the market is really underestimating what this geopolitical risk could spell for deal making in, in capital markets. So I think you'll have to um, you'll probably see investors really putting that question to Goldman today um, since so much of their business relies on the you know historical Wall Street business. Um, are they worried about things like what happened in Israel over the weekend kind of undermining all of the work that they've done to get deal making back um, up and running. Uh, uh, Jenny, overall, I mean, how do, you, how do you kind of, you know, when you look at a lot of the banks, who will be best in class? I think, I mean, they all have their different strengths. So especially with Goldman, you know, we think about the kind of core Wall Street businesses of putting together deals, getting equity capital markets back under up and running, debt underwriting, um, trading, of course. And so I think for those businesses, of course, Goldman is, is always going to look pretty strong relative to peers. Um, but then again, with J.P. Morgan, Citi, Bank of America tomorrow, um, those are businesses you really think about things like the consumer and, and kind of mm -hmm. trying to gauge the health of the U.S. consumer. Um, and it'll be interesting to kind of see what Bank of America says tomorrow. I know um, with J.P. and Citi on Friday, things actually still looked pretty OK. Mm -hmm. The credit metrics came and strong. Um, obviously, net interest income is not where these banks really want it to be, but um, things still look pretty okay. Jenny, thank you so much. Jenny Serain there with the very latest on Wall Street. Up next, to Bloomberg Brief, Danny Berger and Manus Cranny in New York, and this is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.